Hey, everybody. This is uh, Jeff Emmett here. I'm a token engineering researcher at the Common Stack and communications at Block Science. And I'm here today with Andrew Clark, who is a data scientist at Block Science and also doing his PhD in monetary economics at the University of Reading. Uh, and today we will be going through the um, CAD CAD model for the Community Inclusion Currency Project, which is a uh, development initiative with the Red Cross currently ongoing in Kenya right now in collaboration with uh, Grassroots Economics. And we wanted to dive into the development of the CAD CAD model uh, and how it can uh, aid and uh, assist in operational decision support for uh, the ongoing initiative uh, with the Red Cross. So, uh, Andrew. Um, you were, were the lead uh, data scientist putting together this model. Maybe you can uh, talk us through a little bit of the um, the use of this type of model in um, complex system design. Definitely. Um, so what we were, the goal of this project was to create a, a scaffold essentially on in complex systems modeling using a, a, a type of modeling paradigm called CAD CAD to uh, allow grassroots economics the ability to make system level decisions about when you should include fees, uh, like how to administer uh, distributions to, to individual agents, the type of uh, macroeconomic decision making required when running a system like this, when it's, it's a net outflow system, how do you keep uh, the system equitable and, and uh, improving performance? And there's lots of considerations to be a part of. Um, and what the, the, the goal of this model is basically a digital twin of the economy is to help them answer these high-level decision makings of they're moving over to bond, to a bonding curve, for instance, from strict uh, vouchers, moving to, to bonding curve and uh, off of Bancor protocol, things like that. Those types of major decisions you have to make, it's very hard to just do that from the seat of your pants or uh, they're doing, they've done a fantastic job. Like a lot of the, the simulations have validated what, what they were already doing anyway, but having the ability to have a tool to help fact check and, and, and verify assumptions you have is a very powerful, powerful thing and that's what the goal of a lot of block science and uh, and work is 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 creating these types of simulators for economies and uh, it, whether crypto or or these type of de developmental economic projects awesome uh, so when you say digital twin uh, maybe we can give a, an analogy for uh, for viewers here so a digital twin is something like a, a simulation that's running in parallel to the real system is that right yes yes it's as as close as possible um, creating a sim uh, simulation of what's happening in the real system. You can think of it like a flight simulator, essentially. When before right. you build an airplane, you have some sort of a flight simulator that has the physics and things about how how the plane is going to interact with the air and the air pressure and all those sorts of things. You can see how it's going to perform under stress and things before you put a pilot in the seat. That's essentially what right. we're trying to do here is as closely as possible, replicate the actual economy and then be able to test things and stress tests and stuff. So we'll know if something breaks before it's implemented in the system actually actually messes up. So using a lot of these engineering principles and things like like that that haven't traditionally been used in economics, that you'd never build a bridge without stress testing it virtually first with a, a, a computer simulation software. Well, in e economics, a lot of times that's not the case. So this is allowing us to do those sorts of things. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I was reading an article lately about um, digital twins used in aviation. So you know, a plane taking off from London to Paris uh, its engine is running for, say, an hour and a half or two hours, and the digital twin simulation is also running for two hours. And when the engineer plugs in his diagnostic tool uh, at the end of the flight, they can compare it with simulation and see, you know, uh, basically it's a way of managing complexity. What are the temperatures and pressures and all the other readings in this engine so that the engineer knows, you know, when they compare against simulation data where there might be problems or, or issues. So this is now kind of the economic mm -hmm. parallel for that, right? Exactly. And that's what, as an economist, what really excites me is that we're finally doing that kind of thing for economics and being able to work with great projects such as grassroots economics in, in looking at developmental pro problems and things like that, where we don't even have a long history of, of policy and things. This is a very, very valuable tool to help create new ways of uh, monetary policy interactions and things like that. But fantastic right. analogy. Yeah. And so this this helps us to understand the the system structure and the value flows and how uh, policy decisions in these in these value flows can affect uh, how these systems work in the real world. So this is a way that we can uh, gain a better understanding of how to uh, uh, change or or implement those policies at a at a high level. 
Um, great. So um, I have pulled up here on the screen the uh, the system model of the the full uh, CIC initiative. Um, so maybe we can just walk through, uh, and maybe you can explain a little bit the the different boxes here that we're looking at, and some of the the high level value flows between these uh, between these systems. Definitely. So we have three main boxes here. We have the blue box, which is um, the individual agents and subpopulations interacting, the people that are using the CIC. And they all, basically they're doing like Jeff and I could be having a transaction. That's what these, these agents that are shown in there, the flows, uh, these agents interacting, buying goods and services, things like that with CIC in, in the economy and the local economy. Then they can... they can interact externally with the external economy, which is people that aren't part of this network because Community currencies are for the specific community. So when you want to interact with the outside world, you have to do that in the regular uh, currency of the of the nation, and you have that flow there. And then this mixing process here of these individuals interacting in a local economy is being um, being supported by this pink box, which is the currency operator in this case, Grassroots Economics. Which what they're doing is they're the ones administrating uh, this this system. You could think of them as the pseudo. Uh, fractional reserve banking system, for instance, the central bank of this economy, for lack of a better, better word, where they're, right. they're distributing tokens when you join the system, you, you get the CIC token voucher, um, and then with through the mechanism right there, and then you're allowed to buy back at certain policies. Uh, you, you can take your CIC and move it back to, to fiat, Kenyan shilling, for instance, in this implementation. Um, and they're the ones that are distributing this. They can provide basically universal basic income. They can do a lot of different things here to try and stimulate the economy and help add liquidity to these rural regions that really have just been in barter economies. We're adding the liquidity to have a regular exchange. That's what's really exciting about this project. And they have a couple of things going on with them because based on the system, they're handing out these vouchers that are based that are locked into a currency. Like there, there is a relationship that underlying value to, to their CIC vouchers. And they're constantly giving them out and people are redeeming it for cash. So they constantly have an outflow of money from the system. So you see the little red cross logo on the top of the top right in the pink box. Currently, they're being supported by uh, by some groups from the Red Cross that help provide them um, some money for operating expenses and to help support the system. And it's this is the, the big problem we have is an inventory control problem here is how do they make sure they don't run out of either uh, CIC tokens to be handing people or 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 fiat for their operations and the the withdrawals and things. So there's lots of things we could do on there, but the scaffold of the model essentially is this net outflow problem and how they interact with the, the blue box. And the, the green box here is what's really cool, what's happening, it's a changeover. I think the goal is to have it completely change over by August, which is cur currently the system had just been basically these vouchers that they say it's worth X amount and, and it's ba based out of a bank account, essentially. They're just giving paper vouchers. To add a little bit more scalability and interop interoperability with different groups, and um, just provide a little bit more of a concrete backing to this. They're using the bank core protocols we previously mentioned to create an, a bonding curve. So essentially what this means is they, they can put a certain amount of leverage on there um, and it, it is, it is an automatic way of determining what the price of a token should be based off of, of, of the supply of the underlying reserve asset simply. So what they have here is currently the grassroots operator and a couple investors, the only people who get to interact with this bonding curve, but it's the way of determining the price of the CIC and, and things like that. And it's just kind of like the back, backdrop to really make it a solid economic system that's scalable and be used across versus having like a single point of failure. Um, so we have that, that interaction here is agents currently the in the blue box interact only with the pink box. The pink box, when they need to fix that inventory control problem between the you're running out of a fiat or you're running out of CIC, they can interact with the bonding curve if you need to buy more tokens or if you need to buy more shillings. So there's a lot of moving pieces here from an economics perspective. And that's what what the goal is, is figure out like optimizing parameters. And this is what we've built so far in this project is, is this model. And then the simulation behind it is the scaffold of that airplane that allows us to then go in and test the different assumptions uh, with this digital twin to make sure that we get all these little allocations right. Because anybody familiar with economics and managing these types of sy systems sees how many places this could go wrong, but where it can go right, but all of the different triggers and, and parameters and things to tune. So that's where this gets really exciting is this model has been now made into code, which we'll walk through, that allows us to test these assumptions and see how all these, these parts integrate together. Right. So yeah, so I think it's important to, to mention that the, this initiative has been live for probably about 10 years uh, under grassroots economics. Um, and they started uh, initially issuing paper money 
Um, and in its current form, as Andrew mentioned, they're, they're running uh, um, smart contracts uh, with Bancor bonding curves and uh, users interact with uh, feature phones on, on USSD. Um, and the way this, this works at a, at a high level, uh, in these rural communities in Kenya, uh, they, they often have liquidity crises at parts of the year. So in other words, uh, there's, there's still work to be done. There's still people who want to do work, but nobody has cash uh, to facilitate the transaction. Um, so what Grassroots Economics has been doing is basically um, initiating a currency creation process. So for every $1 of, of Red Cross funding, they actually create $4 in local currency, um, and then they give that out through various um, distribution policies or disbursement policies, which you can see here in the model, um, and they reclaim them through buyback policies. So, of course, um, they need to have policies around this because if you engage in money creation like that and everybody just redeems it for the, the collateral, the 25% uh, collateral, the system would collapse. So they have certain policies in place uh, to, to limit buybacks and manage disbursements so that the, the currency, as, as Andrew mentioned, the inventory control problem uh, between fiat and CIC tokens is, is managed. Um, and of course, moving forward in this, uh, in this system to, to make it long-term sustainable, uh, the goal is to open up this bonding curve to all users so that you can kind of have this um, mutual support network so that when, when there is a, um, more uh, interest or more production in the community, the, the price of the token, um, you know, you, can, you have this arbitrage opportunity with the bonding curve that can continue, uh, continually fund these communities uh, and provide liquidity through responsibly engineered currency creation, essentially. Um, but as Andrew mentioned, this is a very complex process. Um, so this is where the modeling comes in, that we can start to um, understand the assumptions in this system and run them through all sorts of uh, data science uh, analytics tools like uh, parameter sweeps and Monte Carlo analyses so that we can see how these systems evolve and what kind of mechanisms we need to deploy uh, to protect against uh, collapse in sort of these complex adaptive systems. It's not necessarily intuitive uh, how they will unfold over time. So this is where um, you know, data science and, and these models can really come in handy. Um, awesome. So you can see, yeah, there's, um, I mean, uh, we need to make, be very clear about the assumptions that we're making uh, in these models, because of course, you know, when you create uh, agent-based models, uh, you start from some initial conditions and what those initial conditions are um, really uh, makes a big difference in how your simulation can play out. Um, so Andrew, do you maybe want to talk a little bit about um, the assumptions that we made in terms of, you know, agent preferences um, and sort of the, the um, the visibility uh, or the granularity that we look at uh, the agents in this system? Definitely, yes. So whenever you're doing some sort of a modeling uh, project, there's gonna be some things you can you can learn from the data and some things that you're gonna have to just have assumptions for. Some of those can be completely based off of what's happening in the real world. A lot of the assumptions we have in the model are based off of, of what Grassroots is doing, but then there's some that you kind of have to infer or calculate. So essentially what we're doing is, uh, there's a lot of different assumptions here, but we've routed as many as possible in data. So like to determine how we're gonna model the interaction of the agents in that blue box that we showed a minute ago, um, there's there's different levels of how you can model a system. There's You can do system dynamics essentially, which is just like the inputs and outputs flows of, of, a, of a system. That's traditionally what a lot of equilibrium models and a lot of things in, in economics are, which is basically like, What's the net inflow of cash out of for the year? What's the GDP change? Those sorts of things. And then there, on the other extreme, there's agent-based modeling, which is uh, J how much money are Jeff and I interacting with on each day of the week, and what's my what's my balance, and all those sorts of very very low-level things. That's like those are two extremes. They're both good for different things. Um, Will from Grassroots Economics has a bunch of really great agent-based modeling, he calls Village Simulator Series, I believe, that shows like that the interaction and how CIC is powerful in giving in those lifts. That's a fantastic uh, illustration tool. Um, and it's really good for modeling those sorts of an, an behaviors, agent-based modeling. For the purposes of our model here, we wanted to be able to do, as we talked about, like the macro level decision-making properties you have of, of how grassroots is gonna have fees and things, but we wanted to provide more detail than you traditionally have in those sorts of system uh, dynamics models. So we use something called subpopulation modeling. So for those CIC user agents in the in the blue box, we're, we're using subpopulations, which means 
um, there's, there's clusters of people that usually interact with each other. So we're modeling the inter-cluster um, flows of money and things like that, but not the intra, not the internal of clusters. So we can get uh, detail without going all the way to agent-based level because it's computationally prohibitive to do like really good simulations on agent-based when you have 20,000 or more agents and all different and just the complexity there. But you can still get the big flows with still a lot more um, more uh, detail than you would traditionally have by using something called subpopulation modeling, which you could think of as a graph of agents interacting with nodes and, and edges of, of agents interacting with each other. You zoom up 40,000 feet or so, and you get these subpopulations. So how we got these subpopulations is completely routed in data as we tried without doing a, uh, too many assumptions. We took the first um, five months of data this year from, from the CIC project, and what we did is we used some machine learning algorithms essentially to, to cluster transactions based off of the, the grouping, the natural groupings that emerge. And we were able to use um, some statistics to find out what's the optimal amount of clustering um, given the, the, the different uh, restrictions we have. So we found that 50 different clusters or subpopulations adequately represent ma the majority of the variability in the system while still being able to allow us to do some, uh, some the calculations we need for, for determining the system level flows. We also determined uh, we're using like utility and demand and stuff like that from, from agents. Uh, the plot right here that, that Jeff is showing is showing that the, the big red dots are, are showing one, one below. The big red dots are showing uh, where, the, where our clusters are. This is all, the, all of the complexity that you have and all these user interactions into two dimensions. So uh, we, we are showing that most of the little dots, multicolored dots, we have most of them covered by the big red dots. It's showing that most of the, the variability in the system we are capturing with these 50 clusters. And to determine how much users are spending and how much they want to spend and determine how, how efficient the CIC tool is and how, how well it's doing at capturing their, their needs and wants, um, we, we were able to get from these subpopulation clusters, we were able to compute what's the, the type of transaction they have, what's the demand that they have. Um, some clusters, they're interacting about 200 CICs on average. Some are doing 2,000. It just depends on the different groups and what their goals are. And we can derive their demands and utility functions from this real data. So these were really like the building blocks of what the model is. And this is the harder stuff to model the assumptions, the subpopulations. And then the larger assumptions we made are very broad and we work with grassroots economics and like, we wanna see the flows in your bank accounts. Well, what's your aggregate bank account amount? That sort of thing. So we, we, had, we didn't really have to make up too many assumptions out of nowhere. Basically every assumption we have is routed in either transactional data or real world data at a macro level. Awesome. So, so essentially we kind of have a, this model can act a bit like a microscope. We can we can zoom in to the agent level uh, and see and see some of that uh, individual transaction data. But when we're doing um, you know all this kind of big data analysis, that's kind of a lot of data to crunch. So we can zoom out a bit, uh, either all the way to the system level where we see these sort of like inflows and outflows, and we can kind of zo zoom into this uh, Goldilocks zone of the subpopulation level, and we can see these like aggregate uh, spends between clusters. Uh, and, and kind of get an idea of how how funds flow between those groups. Is that is that a good summary of, of that kind of subpopulation level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're the Goldilocks uh, middle middle ground here. Of cool. we don't have the the agent detail that Will's uh, sim simulators have, for instance, but we have a lot more than most economic decision making tools have. So it's kind of like the happy middle ground that allows us to do some really good experiments and some really detailed analysis while still being able to do it on a local computer. Awesome, cool. Um, and so when we when we talk about agent utility, uh, I noticed you mentioned that that before. So those are kind of determining what they're what they're going to spend, what they want to spend on, right? So so we've <laughs> ordered these in terms of what the data showed that people were buying, for example, uh, food and water before shopping. Um, so we kind of ordered the utilities in in these in this way according to the data that we saw from the live system. Is that correct? Correct. Great. Awesome. Um, so we'll continue walking through the the notebook here, so you can see a lot of the uh, um, formalized definitions uh, or derivations of uh, the mathematics that go behind the the bonding curve uh, and some of the other initialization work. Um, maybe we can chat a little bit about this system step walkthrough or the, the um, differential specification as we call it. Um, and I can pull up a, a larger version here. Um, and this is sort of the, the wiring up of this diagram that we saw earlier so that we can put it into uh, CAD-CAD and start to, to crunch all this data. Is that right? Yes. So CAD-CAD is a, is a 
modeling paradigm and tool that allows you to use different different levels of modeling like we've talked about. And how we define uh, these types of, of systems is there's there's really four levels to a model, which are you have behaviors, which are user behaviors, such as do I want to interact with Jeff or not? Those are sorts of like, depends on what type of an agent we're modeling. There's certain behaviors. Um, in this case, it's like the mixing process, the grassroots economics, what are their decisions? Then we have, uh, we have mechanisms, which are when you make a decision of behavior, then you need to update, uh, you need a function that executes that behavior. That's what these mechanisms are. And then what they do is they update a state variable, which is you could think of your bank account uh, in any given state of time. We can have two types of, of state variables. One that shows the change in what, what your bank account was from the beginning of today to the end of today and what your aggregate bank account total is, for instance. So state variables are what shows at given one period of time in the system, what is the, what is the value, either the flow or the static value. And then we have metrics, which are, and it's more of an economic-y thing or, or you know, any type of business or economic type of thing, it's more like the aggregate, how do we know the system is doing what it should be doing type things. So they're, the, they're help us answer those questions. So this is really a, uh, a way that we outlined all the different parts, the sequential steps that are happening in the system. So this whole thing here is laying out all of the steps that happen in one run. If you want to do the run one as, uh, as one day, one month, one year, doesn't matter the time scale, but in one, one step of the simulation, we have all of these different different components that happen. So as you can see, there's a lot of detail in this model because there's a lot of policies and inside each one of these behaviors, there's policies and decision making, such as like what's the spend allocation of agents? How do we do how do we do those allocations over all the agents? Keeping track of the the different network graphs and all these types of things. There's a lot of complexity in here, but it's shown in these four categories of behaviors, mechanisms, states, and metrics. Awesome. So in this type of model, when we have uh, you know agents interacting, so the the behaviors of those agents can uh, affect the mechanisms that uh, basically update the states um, and inform the metrics of this system. So this is basically the the wiring up of everything behind the scenes in the CAD CAD model, so that when uh, when we run these uh, kind of generative um, simulations, then the yeah, this is this is how it's all wired up in in the back end. Great. Uh, awesome. So, oops, wrong book. There we go. Um, so yeah, so now we get into sort of the, um, the, the mathematics behind it. So there's, there's all sorts of, uh, again, sort of these, these early assumptions. So, um, in our initial uh, model, the Red Cross, uh, drips funds to grassroots economics every 90 days, but of course it doesn't have to be every 90 days. Maybe we, um, you know, through our decision-making processes from this model, uh, we decide that it should be maybe 60 days or 30 days. So there are different ways that we can um, sort of run uh, parameter sweeps and change some of these uh, parameters and see how that would affect the system more positively or negatively, and then help that, uh, that can allow us to make better decisions in how we launch these systems, right? Correct. Great. Not um, really about CAD CAD is we can do these parameter sweeps and things like that and then see what the outcome is and see where 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 things will um, will land and what's the optimal value. Uh, so there's so many different things we could see here. So the Red Cross thing is more like being a decision making process with the Red Cross, what makes sense. But there's also very much system level parameters such as bonding curve initializations and stuff that's really technical that this is really helpful with. So this is a pretty uh, basic plot, but it's showing that like the difference on the agent spend you can see depending on how much money is being injected into the system. This is uh, agent spend has a lot of variability in it, as you can see. But it, it's like one example. This is a template of that we've created here of how you would do a parameter sweep. These aren't fully documented or, or of tests, but you can see the difference in some values that will change based off of uh, that flow. And other times they won't change. It just depends on what that specific variable and behavior is and how it, how that uh, parameter sweeping aspect is being is affecting it. Right. Awesome. So there's definitely a lot of uh, complexity under the hood um, that we're, you know, uh, that goes into into these notebooks. But ultimately, if we if we bring it back up to the high level, um, I think the, the the big question is, you know, what kinds of questions uh, can this answer for groups like the Red Cross who want to launch uh, stable systems and and uh, sustain them in the long term? What kind of questions can can a model like this answer for the Red Cross? And and how do we go about that process? Mm -hmm. So we, it's basically scientific method of, of having, you know, an idea and testing that hypothesis and rigorously analysis type of things. 
some example questions we've we've put up here, which is uh, what's the critical mass of users that need to be interacting to to make this system viable and keep the liquidity constant? Uh, you know, how much should you allocate to individual agents before running out of, fine, of funds, for instance? Um, when should you introduce fees? Like currently, Red Cross can't can't subsidize the project forever per se, especially when you get larger and larger funding requirements. Who should what fee should we introduce? Who should we introduce them to? Traders, investors, individuals that are transacting? What should those fees be? These all types of scenarios are what's great about it. A model such as in CADCAD is we can take these components, add little testing components, A, B test, parameter sweep, these different questions and using scientific method derive what's going to be the best outcome given that this flight simulator is, is in tune with, um, with what's happening in reality. Great. So, so this is essentially a um, kind of test gridding where we can put in all sorts of uh, questions and, and assumptions, and then use the the model to crunch the data and and let us know, you know, what are what are better decisions, what are what decisions will lead to deterioration of the system or uh, or loss of funds or anything like that. Is that right? Correct. Awesome. Uh, cool. So. Yeah, so I guess the the big question is, what is the what are the next steps on this model? Um, where where is it at um, today, and where what are the where where can we take it from here? Mm -hmm. So we've essentially created the scaffold or the the airplane body, for instance, of of how this whole system works at a at a rough level. There's some simplifying assumptions we've made, um, such as right now we have all agents withdraw at the same time every every month. We have, uh, of course we can add it so they have the randomized withdraw times, such as every agent starts differently. There's, certain, there's a lot of things we could do there. So there's improving the, the clarity of the model, essentially, re re reducing the error from real world data, essentially, by, by tweaking some of these assumptions. But then the big things, because we built this first phase of we have the flight simulator, the, most, the biggest lift that you're going to get in the next phases are doing these, these testings of like, how are we cutting over users to the bonding curve? When should we allow users to interact with the bonding curve? What should the fees be? All of those sorts of decision-making processes, we've set up the scaffold that now you have a, a good flight simulator that now you can start testing those assumptions and making decisions on how to run the system. And that's really what the, the value is. And those are really the, like a lot of the next steps. Awesome. So, so part one of this collaboration was essentially building the race car and part two is now putting it to use. We now have this, this digital twin of the CIC system. We can now start answering some, some big questions uh, on behalf of the Red Cross or, or any group that is looking to launch uh, local currency uh, and, and give them better decision-making uh, insight into how different uh, parameters may affect their system as they, as they launch. Um, great, so in terms of any other um, uh, call out. So I know you're you're obviously deep in in the data science world. Um, is there any other way that uh, you know contributors can help with this model or or contribute to um, the research that's being done here? Yes, definitely. Um, even in traditional economics, there's, there's a very large gap in in the type of problems we're facing here and where the literature is. So there's lots of economic research to be done around developmental economic currencies, community currencies, all these types of different using these sorts of systems and, and using even uh, blockchain style projects for, for universal basic income, all these different questions. There's a bunch of research questions that we're, we're coming up with on the fly questions too, as we, as we can, but there's lots of areas where we could have thoroughly researched uh, ways that could help in simulations such as this. So that's definitely one big part. And then always, um, as you see, there's a lot of work here running these simulations. So there's, there's definitely the data science and the economic side. And then also just uh, awareness you know, I mean, even tweeting about this type of thing, you know, basic uh, blog posts, there's just lots of, uh, of areas for, for improvement and where, where help can be used. Mm -hmm. And are, are there any, would you say, are there any um, parallels, any other kinds of modeling of, of these systems? And, and what, what sets CADCAD apart uh, from, from other tools that are used to do this kind of economic modeling? Mm -hmm. um, it, the the flexibility is definitely key, and the multi paradigm. So a lot of times you have you have programs such as Stella that does system dynamics modeling great. You have Mat, MATLAB that does certain things. There's different modeling paradigms. CAD CAD is very flexible, um, trying to be very much in the Python ecosystem. That's very plug and play. Uh, that's that it makes it very good and very easy to pull in machine learning algorithms and things like that and integrate it all together. So that's really that in the multi paradigm approach. You can start system dynamics and then go all the way down to agent based modeling or multi scale modeling all within the same framework. 
that is huge when you're doing simulations as on most software packages these days, you'll get locked into something specific and it's very hard to try and change paradigms. So those are just a couple of the like big differentiators on why we used CAD CAD for this project versus other software out there. And it's open awesome. source also, that's that's another way to contribute as well is the underlying tooling is is help contribute to, to CAD CAD as well. All right. Awesome stuff. Great. Well, I think this was a good uh, first run through of, of the model. And uh, I'm sure we'll uh, have some people with, with more questions. Is there um, anywhere? I think we've got uh, a telegram group, uh, t.me slash cadcad underscore org. Uh, if people have more questions about the model or, uh, or are interested in uh, getting involved further with that community, that's a great place to connect. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really excited to uh, continue working on uh, part two of this uh, of this model and start giving uh, providing some operational decision support for uh, you know these important uh, sustainable development initiatives worldwide um, great so this has been a wonderful uh, recording and we'll look forward to hearing from you again soon Thanks.